Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, many of you know me, but my name is Bridger Layton. I'm the Education Programs Coordinator for the Conservancy, and I'm excited that, once again, we are sharing this event with the Wenatchee River Institute. And so, yeah, welcome to those of you who are tuning in from, um, from the Leavenworth area. We're excited to, to be here with you. Um, and thanks to the Wenatchee River, River Institute for, yeah, providing support and being a part of the event as well. Um, I'll keep my intro short and sweet today because I know we have um, a good meaty presentation coming up, but I do know that um, many of you are keeping tabs on the campaign for Sunny M Ranch. And so if you're new to our audience, that's an effort to protect 1,200 acres near the town of Winthrop. And the project touches on pretty much all of our organization's values, ranging from supporting agriculture to affordable housing to wildlife habitat. Um, and we're really excited that we're entering the home stretch of the fundraising effort to purchase um, the 1200 acre Sunny M Ranch. And so um, for those keeping tabs, we are also dangerously close to meeting our goal of having 1200 individual donors, 1200 donors for 1200 acres, um, which will unlock a challenge pool of $100,000 that was put together by six donors. And so um, dangerously close, but not there yet. So um, it's not too late to make a donation of any amount um, and be a part of the effort to, to get that extra hundred grand um, in, in the bank. Uh, we update the campaign website on Wednesdays and today's Tuesday. So tomorrow is, uh, is the day to go check out the Sunny M Ranch website, which is easily accessible from the Conservancy's main site. Um, and you can see exactly where we're at. Um, yeah, closing in. And I think that's all from the Conservancy side. I want to pass it over to Joshua at WRI and give him a chance to talk about what they're up to. And then I'll introduce Natalie and we'll get rolling. Yeah, thanks, Bridger. Um, I really appreciate being involved in this. And I do hope that we have some folks from the Wenatchee Valley area joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Wenatchee River Institute, our campus is here in Leavenworth, and uh, our mission is to connect people, communities, and the natural world. And uh, we do that through programs such as this that we're able to work with uh, Metal Conservancy on, um, different workshops that we hold. And then also we have lots of youth programming uh, to bring kids um, uh, education in, their, in the place they are or to bring them up here. A uh, couple of things that we have going on. The, the biggest thing is our uh, Leavenworth Spring Bird Fest, which will be the third weekend here in May. And that's a great time. We have in your valley too, but here as well, we have lots of migrating birds coming through. And so it's a fun time to uh, join some birders, go into some unique um, environments and kind of have a guided trip that way. Um, so if you're interested in birding or uh, just starting to think about it because there are lots of trips that uh, are great for beginners. Um, just head over to our website and you can see uh, Leavenworth Spring Bird Fest, what uh, is still available there. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, thank you, Bridger. Um, so now for the main event, um, Dr. Natalie Chardon is a field ecologist with over a decade of field work under her belt and she wanted me to mention that she spends very little time in a lab, that a lot of her work, almost all of it, um, happens in the outdoors in incredible places like that backdrop screen of hers in the North Cascades. Um, and so, yeah, even when she's on Zoom, she's in the mountains. Um, but Natalie was in the Methow last fall and spent two days out in the woods with Methow Conservancy groups. Um, we were learning and we also helped disassemble some research sites that were located some of them probably within like 15 or 20 minutes of where some of you are zooming in from up in Mazama off, um, yeah, Goat Creek Road or Goat, wait, not important. Um, but it's always neat to have research happening so close to home. And I'm looking forward to, yeah, hearing more about what Natalie learned from her research last year. And um, with that, I'll pass it on to Natalie for her presentation about how plants are responding to climate change here in our, our home landscape and other landscapes nearby. Thank you, Bridger. Let me just do the screen share magic. 
And can someone just quickly confirm that they're seeing the correct screen? Great. Well, thank you, Bridger and Joshua, for organizing this event. And thank you all for attending. I know it's dinner time, and I suspect many of you are eating behind your screens, and that's great. I am deeply grateful to present this talk on the lands of the Squamish Nation up here in British Columbia. And I'm excited to talk to you all about a project I've been working on where my collaborators and I are aiming to understand how plants are coping with climate change. And the bottom line, this is very, very difficult to do. And I'll talk about this for the next half hour or so. My project that I've been working on over the last couple of years is focused in the Washington Cascades, both in the Rainy Pass and Mount Baker regions. And I want to respectfully acknowledge the Thompson Salish, Nooksack, Okanagan, and Metau peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Like most mountain regions, the Cascades are warming at higher rates than the rest of the globe. And this is really concerning because the Cascades provide water to a lot of Washington. And while we're seeing ecological responses to warming, there's much we don't know. And so to understand how plants or really any species cope with climate change, we first need to understand their distribution. And so a species distribution is simply the geographic space it inhabits. This can refer to a local distribution. For example, in this valley in Colorado, you're seeing a pine tree is distributed along these alpine slopes. And at a certain point, it just stops and there's no more trees above the tree line. And so that would be a local distribution limit. You'll also notice there's no trees in the very wet valley bottom, and that's also a local distribution limit. However, species distributions are of course also global. And so when we refer to a global species distribution, like this plant I studied for my PhD has this distribution across the Northern hemisphere shown by this green spatial patterning, then that's not so much local up a mountain slope, but rather where across the world or a country or a region is it distributed. And so we've known for a really long time that climate determines species distributions. And a biogeographer, Alexander von Humboldt, was the first to define this theory in the early 1800s with his beautiful maps. He showed that different climates at different latitudes and elevations determine large scale species distributions. And so here in this really picture of his maps, we can see that the same community types are depicted at higher elevations at the equator, so that's in the middle of the picture, as at lower elevations towards either the North or the South Pole. Species distribution research still largely relies on the relationship between broad geographic distributions and climate, but what I'll talk about today is how microclimate or microhabitat can influence species distributions. And this is really important because what determines species distributions is a really integral part of understanding how biodiversity responds to climate change. And virtually all predictions of how biodiversity responds to climate change are based on these ideas of what sets or determines limits favors species distribution. So changes in these environmental factors such as temperature and precipitation, as well as biological factors such as pollination and herbivory will cause species distribution shifts into what we call suitable areas. So you could imagine that this green spatial patterning of the plant I studied for my PhD will shift as the constraints on that species distribution change. This could be the temperatures are warmer, it becomes wetter or drier, or a pollinator is not available. And with climate change, which is just one of the many aspects of global change, which also includes land use change, we know that a lot of these factors are shifting and changing. And this is causing a lot of plants and animals to shift their range, which track their suitable climate. And often this will be in the poleward direction or up in elevation. And so to visualize this idea of shifting into a climatically suitable area, here's a simple example on tree line. If the upper elevational range limit of a pine tree species is shown here in red, is limited primarily by temperature and the temperature rises, the areas higher above on the slope will become climatically suitable. And I'm indicating that here with this orange dashed line. 
And so then we would expect that pine species, that pine tree to shift its elevation, its range upward in elevation into these climatically suitable areas where that pine tree should be able to successfully grow, survive, and reproduce. However, we often don't see species shifting their ranges into these climatically suitable areas, which are really macroclimatically suitable, right? They're, they're suitable on a large, broad scale. And we don't know why species aren't doing this. So I just mentioned that not all species shift their distribution into macroclimatically suitable areas, for example, higher in elevation of a mountain slope. And here's an example of a global study to illustrate this. My friend Sabine Rumpf looked at the elevational shifts for lots of plants around the globe, and she found that overall plants do shift upward in elevation. So you can see that by the positive slope in both the red and the blue lines, and you don't have to worry about what they are right now. And the positive slope just indicates that as the temperature change is greater, there's a greater elevational shift. And that's the comparing the X to the Y axis. However, if we focus on the individual data points, you could just focus on the, on the mean, on the dots, which indicate the mean of each of these lines, we can see that many of the data points are actually under the zero shift line. And that not all distributions shift up in elevation like we would expect, but some are not shifting and others are actually shifting down. So again, that's any of the points that are under this dashed line. The red lines here simply indicate uh, the rear edges are shifting. So on a mountain, this would be the bottom of the elevational distribution limit and the blue lines indicate shifts in the leading edge. So in a mountain example, that'd be the top of the elevational or the higher elevational distribution limit. And so, What's really key about this is that we just don't know why some species are responding in what we think of as a predictable way and others are not. So these distribution limits by species are not just set by macroclimate, but also microhabitat suitability. So when we think of macroclimate in ecology, we think of things like regional mean annual temperature and rainfall, which is data that we get from weather stations. But microhabitat suitability isn't reflected in that data. And that can be things like, I've just circled some examples on this uh, mountain example where the green circles indicate microhabitat suitability being different from macro climate suitability. So for example, on the left, I've circled a persistent summer snow patch. So we could imagine that the microhabitat in that area is vastly different from the hot slopes that get lots of sun in the summertime. I've also in the middle of the picture circled a huge cliff band, which while that's not climatically different, that is microhabitat that is unsuitable for that tree species. And then I've also circled some large open sunny slopes in the lower left, or right hand of the picture where pine trees aren't growing. That could be due to grazing, that could be due to something in the soil, who knows. And so really what this means is that macro and micro habitat suitability are just not always the same. And areas that are macroclimatically suitable might not have suitable microclimate or microhabitat. And if you have questions, I'm sort of monitoring the chat, but feel free to just pop anything in there and we'll have time for questions at the end. So even though my macroclimate might be suitable, dispersal limitation or germination limitation due to unsuitable microhabitat would prevent a species distribution shift. And so here in these two cartoons, I'm illustrating a species current range with the red bracket or current distribution, and it's climatically suitable area with the orange dashed bracket. And so one major reason why a species might not shift into macroclimatically suitable area is because it's dispersal limited. It could theoretically germinate and be successful in this area, but it simply can't get there. It's either too far or a disperser is lacking, among other reasons. And the second major reason why a species might not shift into its macroclimatically suitable area is because of a germination limitation. So it has no problem getting there, but for a variety of reasons, it can't germinate. And so when I talk about germination for those not terribly familiar without plants, I'm talking about an individual seed germinating, popping out of the ground to become a seedling. And so this germination limitation might be because of unfavorable or lack of favorable 
biotic or, or biological soil interactions or unsuitable local climate, even if the macro climate is suitable. And so I refer to these as microhabitat, a word I've been using before. So I'm really just talking about small scale variation in the landscape. And so this is particularly interesting to us because microhabitat is often not represented in the macroclimate variables used to generate predictions or even our ideas of climate suitability. But there's more and more work showing that macro and micro environment can be quite unmatched. So in this graph from a recent study, we're basically just looking at the offset from temperatures that were measured at a regional climate station with understory temperatures in the closest area. And we're seeing that we had up to 10 degrees cooler temperatures in the understory compared to the regional weather stations and up to six degrees warmer than the regional temperature stations. So again, that's a really large variation, right? When we think about the constraints of what plants need to grow, having a difference of 10 degrees is a lot. And so if we think about this in terms of your own backyard, what are some microhabitat features in your backyard that could limit plant growth? And I will give you a quick warning that this is leading into a breakout room. And I'll just illustrate this with an example that Bridger took the other week where in the Meta Valley, we can see here next to this trail that the grass isn't growing right under this pine tree. Perhaps the soil characteristics are different here. But we're also seeing that there's no grass on the trail, right? And that's also microhabitat. It could be, this is, looks like a trail by humans, but it could also be a trampling trail by animals. So now we are going to send you into breakout groups. And I ask you to introduce yourself, share one thing about your backyard, and then think about what are some microhabitat features in your backyard that could limit plant growth? And so the question that you all just discussed is really a major focus of my postdoctoral work at the University of British Columbia, where I'm using a large seed transplant study in macroclimatically suitable areas for many different species to identify microhabitat limitations on seed germination and seed survival, again, in macroclimatically suitable areas. And so the seed transplant experiment is one that Amy Anger at the University of British Columbia and Yannicka Hill Reese Lambers, who used to be at the University of Washington, set up back in 2017. And PhD students Katie Goodwin, as well as Kavya Pradhan, were, have been integral in keeping this experiment going. And ultimately, we aim to understand which plants will move upward in elevation with climate change. And thanks for sharing your answers, everyone, in the chat. And so the experimental design setup consists of two 1200 meter elevational gradients on wet and dry slopes of the Cascade Range with the wet sides being near the Mount Baker area and the dry sites being near the Rainy Pass and Metal Valley area. And so with this gradient of, so with this group of sites, we really capture a large macroclimatic gradient across the Cascades. And so then within each site, we have multiple different plots. And the goal of that is to capture microhabitat variation within sites. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so at each of these sites, we sowed a seed mix of native perennial species ranging from trees to grasses. And we chose these 25 different species based on their relatedness their seed size, and also their prevalence in the area, choosing species with different distributions so that we would capture a range of species potential responses to both macro and microhabitat conditions across our study areas. I've put the list of species here, I won't go over this, but for those of you that know your plants, that list is here on the right. And on the, in the left pictures, you might notice all these cocktail party toothpicks sticking out of the ground. And what we do is when a new seed germinates, we identify a seedling with a certain color and shape of toothpick, and that way we're able to track it every year. And another couple close-up pictures are here. And so what we did in the following year is we recorded seed germination, so any new seed that came out of the ground, as well as seedling survival. And we did that in these paired plots to just have lots of replication in the experiment. 
We measured standard microhabitat variables. Again, we're interested in understanding how microhabitat influences seed germination and seedling survival. So of course we have to measure microhabitat variables. And so we measured canopy cover, estimated it, and we also were able to calculate days of snow from temperature loggers that we had buried in the ground. However, biological and environmental microhabitat parameters are rarely measured, even though this is increasingly shown to explain plant response. And of course, this makes a lot of sense. If any of you have ever gardened, you know that things like soil moisture, soil temperature, how much fertilizer you put in the soil makes a really big difference. But surprisingly, this is often left out of these large biogeographical or ecological studies. And so at each site in the field, we measured soil fungal to bacteria ratio with this really nifty device called the microbiometer. And we also were able to measure soil moisture and soil temperature as well as plant height temperature with these two different kinds of loggers. The lower logger is surrounded by a cage to protect it from wildlife, but it turns out that I think raccoons and bears are much more interested in the cage than anything else. And a lot of these loggers were actually ripped out, unfortunately. And then we also took soil samples back to a lab at the University of Washington where we measured water holding capacity and also carbon to nitrogen ratio. Water holding capacity is simply the amount of water a soil can hold when it's completely saturated. Central to this project was Lauren McBurney, who's pictured here, and she's an undergraduate at the University of British Columbia and is working with our lab. <clears throat> And so to carry out these on-site soil analyses to measure bacterial and fungal content, we first sieved soil from a 10 centimeter soil core, and then we used a solution to extract the microbes from the soil. And then finally, we dropped just three drops of that solution onto the pinwheel that's pictured here. And then we actually use an app to scan the pinwheel and then it will scan the solution and compare it to the grayscale background to detect bacterial versus fungal particles, which is pretty cool. So I wanted to show this, uh, this one method and is a great, and I know that farmers use it and gardeners use it to try to understand variations in their garden. So a fun thing. I promise I'm not paid by microbiometer. I just think this is a really neat way to do field ecology because usually it costs about 120 samples to $120 per sample to send these out to a lab somewhere, and this is only $10 per sample. Okay, moving on from the microbiometer, how does all of this work? At the start of the experiment, we wrote to the Forest Service to ask for permission and inform them of our research. And then at the start of every field season, we spend several months planning the field work, things like ordering supplies, dealing with the budget, making sure we have enough, hiring undergrads, like this last summer we hired Lauren, and then at the beginning of the summer, we use a GPS and we just hike to one of our 30 sites. Then we get to the site and it might be covered in snow. And then we have to come back. If it's not covered in snow, we can put our loggers in the ground and take the soil measurements I just talked about. And then we go back to camp, sleep, eat breakfast, and then repeat. Once we have all of our soil samples, we brought them back to the lab and conducted some additional analyses. And then at the end of the summer, so after the temperature loggers had been out and the soil moisture loggers had been out all summer, I went back to the sites and that's where some of you um, from the Metal Conservancy came and helped to count the last seedlings, take down the lagger, loggers and also remove all introduced seedlings as well as all of the little toothpicks that were buried under sometimes many layers of pine trees or pine needles. So just some pictures from the field sites at Rainy Pass in the Metal Valley. Here uh, you're seeing some of the conservancy members that came and helped in September, which was a really wonderful way to meet many of you local folks. And I really, really appreciated your help. And just generally from the landscape here, we're seeing that this is a much drier and hotter area than the pictures I'll show of Mount Baker. I'll just point out the picture on the upper left this huge tree fell directly over my site so that was a site that required a lot of crawling around to finding all these different seedlings in the mount baker area we have much wetter sites right this is part of the north pacific northwest temperate rainforest 
And here, there was also blueberries in September, which was great. And then if we look at the lower, the middle lower picture where a tree with its sod has completely ended up on, um, has completely fallen over and the sod ended up on the vertical, that's actually, you can't see them, but on this vertical piece of sod are actually one of my set of plots. So there they were, the seedlings were still there. The data analysis from this project are very much still ongoing, so I'll just talk about what I have found so far. And so I've talked a lot about how microhabitat might influence plants, but is microhabitat really that variable in one location? And it is. So what we're looking at here are temperature, hourly soil temperature data from an open versus closed canopy area on one of our sites on Goat Creek Road. And these areas are right next to each other. And you can see that the open canopy has much higher variability in its temperatures in summer 2018. And I've circled this here with the orange circle where we get up to 10 degrees of warmer areas. Or there's it's 10, it can be up to 10 degrees warmer in these areas than in the closed canopy. The part with no data, that's where we have logger problems. So either an animal ran away with it or it stopped working, we never know. And another result with microhabitat variability is that soil microbial biomass, so just how much bacterial content there's in the soil and fungal content in the soil broadly match macroclimatic patterns as seen with these slightly lower values at the low and the high elevation and higher values at mid elevation. But there's really high variation within each site. And I'll just ask you to focus on this orange dotted line that I've drawn to encompass the variation within just one site. And we know it's one site because it's all at the same elevation. So we're actually seeing higher variability within one site than we are across the entire elevational range. And just to bring it back to species distributions, this is really interesting because we generally think of constraints on species distribution happening at macroclimatic scales, like climate shifting along these large elevational gradients. But these graphs really show how much variation we can have within a site. So when we look at germination rates, we find that seed germination is generally very low and varies highly by species. So here I've just plotted very quickly all the species that have germinated and I'm not including any of the zero germination data. So every time a seed didn't germinate, we recorded it at zero, but that completely overwhelms the bottom part of each of these graphs. So I've taken that out. So this is really just, you can think of this as a germination rate. And on the, uh, on the y-axis and then on the, y, on the x-axis, I've just plotted it against the average of summer daily minimum soil temperature, which is um, turned out to be an important factor for these plants. And so if we just perhaps focus on, I hope you can see my cursor, if we just focus on Sorbus sachensis here and also Erigeron peregrinus, we can see that there are, there was, their germination rates, while they both had high germination rates, they really vary with whether the high germination rate happened at higher minimum soil temperature, lower minimum soil temperature, or perhaps there wasn't much of a pattern at all. And so before I show the results, I'm curious to know what you all think, which variables do you think are most important in explaining seed germination? We had planned on sending you into breakout rooms, but we don't think it's possible to send you this variable list. And then I think that would be very confusing. So perhaps if you could just pop your answers into the chat, there's no wrong answers, I promise. Of which of these variables do you think are most important in explaining seed germination for some or all species? So we measured summer soil moisture, summer soil temperature, summer plant height temperature. We measured winter soil temperature and spring snow. And from the soil, we were able to measure carbon and nitrogen ratio as well as water holding capacity and also fungus to bacteria ratio. And then finally, we also were able to estimate canopy cover. Okay, well, feel free to keep adding some answers in, but it looks like we have a very wide range of variables that people think are important. And this is why we measured all these variables, right? Because we thought that these might all be important in explaining seed germination. It turns out that Species have wildly different germination requirements and contrasting patterns even show climate paradox. So 
again, just to explain what you're looking at here. So far, I've analyzed the data to understand what variables are important in understanding how many individuals germinate per species. And unfortunately, I don't have a prettier picture to show you. I did these in that, I finished these analysis this morning, but I would like to point out two patterns that we see. Well, first to orient into this table, what you're seeing is the different species that germinated and showed a response to the variables that we measured listed on the very first column. And then anything that has a plus means that germination was favored by an increase in that variable. If there's a minus, it was not favored by that an increase in that variable. And if there's a double plus or a double minus, it just means that the effect was a lot bigger. And so while each species has a unique set of microhabitat variables that influence the number of seedlings that it produces, there are some overarching patterns. And what I found was that vaccinium, erydron, and sorbus were negatively affected by summer plant height temperature. So the warmer the summers were, the lower the germination rates were for these species. While lupin, erydron, and tolmia had increased germination rates when the winter soil temperature was higher. So I'm calling this a climate change paradox, just very briefly here in front of you all, because that means that while some species really enjoy warmer winter temperatures, which means that as the winters get warmer, they could actually be doing better, other plants really can't handle the hotter summer temperatures. And with the little orange and blue dot respectively, I'm just showing where the logger was placed to measure both plant height temperature and, and soil temperature. And so again, this is just a really tricky situation with climate change, but also represents what's happening across the globe, right? Plants might do better with warmer winter temperatures, but not with higher summer temperatures. So given such differences in germination patterns and the influence of different variables on different species, can we answer which plants will best cope with climate change? I don't really think so. It's really complicated. We do have a couple things that have stood out, right? So one thing is we saw that germination is influenced by a variety of variables. So plants with heterogeneous uh, habitat will, so plants found in many different kinds of habit, microhabitats instead of only say on a sunny open slope will probably do better. We also saw that many species are influenced by soil characteristics, but we need to better understand how soil characteristics are affected by climate change to better understand how individual species respond to changes in soil characteristics. We also saw that germination of vaccinium, erigeron, and sorbus was reduced by summer plant by warmer summer plant height temperature. So these species might struggle to germinate with warmer summers. On the other hand, germination of lupin, erigeron, and tolmia was favored by warmer soil temperatures. So they might be favored with climate change. Since erigeron was affected by both, negatively or positively, we really don't know with this plant. So I've pulled out a few results from my analyses looking at what factors influence seed germination rate. However, all the variables I show had a really low effect size in my statistical models, which really just means we can't actually be that certain of these effects. So next I'll analyze seedling survival data, which could be influenced by different microhabitat variables. And as with any scientific study, we really need these studies to be replicated to confirm these results. And then to actually know whether these species are responding the way we think they will, we really need to track species response in long-term studies. And there are several long-term experiments out there. And with all this info, we can ultimately predict which species will shift upward in elevation. But I hope I've left you with one thing, which is that species responses are very, very complicated. And this might leave you quite unsatisfied, but hopefully you've gained an appreciation for how complicated this can get. From my work, we do know that germination rates are influenced by various microhabitat variables and differ by species. And a lot of predictions out there on how biodiversity responds to climate change are based on, again, our ideas of what influences species distributions, germination rates. But the bottom line is that we still don't have a very good understanding of how different species respond to these differences in microhabitat. 
So I'm always urging other ecologists to use these easily implementable tools like the ones I showed to quantify microhabitat, measure it to understand, and then also predict species response to climate change. That's all I've got for you all today. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do have a few questions. Uh, maybe we can start with what I think is a really good question from Susan Crampton, and that's um, taking a look at artificial seeding versus natural seeding and um, wondering about how difficult it is to actually replicate those conditions and um, yeah, have the artificial thing actually, you know, sort of mimic the, the complexities of the ecosystem. Yeah, Susan, that's a really good question. So what we've tried with this experiment is to basically just remove the dispersal constraint and say, if the species is, if the seed is able to get there, is it able to germinate? Of course, in a natural experiment, if we didn't do anything, we could just look at a plot and see what is arriving year after year, but that wouldn't allow us to differentiate between did a, did a, did a seed not emerge, did a seedling not sh pop up because it couldn't get there? or because there were aspects of, it, of its microhabitat that were unsuitable. Um, one question is, do you feel, after doing this work, do you feel more optimistic that species you know, and biodiversity will persist given that maybe they can find that little microclimate that they need or um, less optimistic knowing that not everything can actually physically move? Yeah, I think that's the big question. We do know that for some species, their extinction risk has actually been somewhat downgraded when we realize how many different kinds of microhabitat it can use, or just simply how many different kinds of microhabitats are available within each range. So we can quite simply just think about, you know, a more northern slope or the more the bottom of a creek drainage is going to be a lot cooler than a big open slope above. And so that is really helpful. So in mountain areas, perhaps we could be we could be more safe than in big open grasslands where there isn't really that much microhabitat, and a species would have to actually move really far to get to any kind of temperature change, right? If you're in a mountain slope, you don't actually have to move that far up in elevation to have to experience a different temperature. Whereas if excuse me, you're on a big open grassland, you actually have to go sometimes hundreds of kilometers just to have a different temperature. So yes and no, I would say for the species that are able to use different kinds of microhabitat and don't have a very tight constraint on their microhabitat requirements, then we probably will see what's called these microclimate refugia. And we know that this has existed from the last glacial maximum where some species were just able to persist in these tiny little refugia where the temperature, the climate was just quite different than everything around. But I don't think all species, and we know that not all species will be able to do that. So, but we just don't know which ones. That's what's so tricky about this work. Sorry about um, the unsatisfying answer. <laughs> that was great. No, no, um, good answer. I uh, have a question here. Uh, just do you have any follow-up work that you're planning for this project? Thanks for your question, Ed, and thanks for tuning in from Maryland. This experiment itself is getting shut down because at this point there were so few surviving seedlings and we were not seeing any new germination, so we shut it down. But people in both the labs I've worked with will be continuing to use this elevational transect to try to get at some of those questions. I myself will be stepping down from this project and I don't have any specific examples of what's being done. One thing that I think will be really neat to see is undergraduate student Lauren McBurney, she's working with a lot of the soil data and is looking at how the different soil characteristics are changing with the different soil moisture and soil temperature variables that we measured. And it'll be really interesting to see how those characteristics respond to climate, different climate variables, since we know that those are really important for uh, seed germination. Oh, no, um, we have a question like rolling in. <laughs> yeah, question from Jan about um, how you sourced your seeds for different species. Did you select local provinces, use reciprocal transplants from different sources, et cetera? It sounds like Jan knows what he's talking about because I don't know all those words, at least <laughs> not when they're put together. 
Yeah, thanks, Jan, for the question. Someone always asks this question, and I should just be more explicit. So some of the seeds were collected locally, just as, as the plants were seeding, the field technicians would collect the seeds, but they weren't necessarily across the entire elevational gradient. And some of them were sourced from nurseries. We have looked at, Lauren did this work, we have looked at whether germination rates are different for the species that we source the seeds locally versus in nurseries, but we didn't find any of differences just visually looking at these effects. But yeah, it's a combination of whether they were able to be found in the field or whether they were from nurseries, yeah. But feel free to pop me a line if you wanna ch chat further about this. Um, there's a question from Annette. Um, what uh, what can we do to help plants survive, adapt to climate climate change in our local areas? That's a really good question. So there's I usually give two answers to this. One is almost nobody does this, but it's a huge game changer is if you are hiking in different areas, scrub off the bottom of your hiking boots and shake out your pants because bringing seeds from one area to another area introduces sometimes invasive species. And that is a major, major threat, especially to alpine plants. And we know that there is an increased prevalence of invasive species along hiking trails and mountain roads. So that's number one if you can think of it, scrub off your shoes. And the other thing is if you have a garden or an area that is available to you, try to create microhabitat, plant different kinds of plants, maybe have a tree, have some shrubs, have, if you're able to have any sort of water source, but just to create microhabitat variation, even within your own backyard, doesn't just help plants, but also pollinators and all the other animals and organisms that use, you know, that, that use these landscapes. Um, so I think we'll do one more question, maybe two. Um, so Christy Stebbins is wondering um, essentially why you didn't look at more of the life cycle um, and wondering, doesn't a plant's ability to actually migrate and survive have to include all the way through from germination to the next round of seed dispersal? And was wondering if that was purely in order to make the research doable and and keep it keep it neat or what sort of the, the process was there yeah so we really were looking we were interested in seeing what are the micro yeah really just trying to parse out different effects so are there aspects of microhabitat that influence germination right again removing any variation that might come from the seeds ability to get there or not through dispersal and it would be really awesome to see these seeds grow up into trees and shrubs, but the bottom line is just seed germination was so low that that's almost not very feasible. And there's not really enough replication within the sites to keep the experiment going, but that was a conversation we had. And in an ideal world, we would have had hundreds of, of these seeds germinate for every species across a large environmental gradient. And then we could have tracked it you know, for decades Although that would have brought us into a very different arena of research and also just manipulation, because if these plants are starting to reproduce, then we're having non-local seeds being dropped in areas where they weren't before. So we weren't trying to get it into the reproduction phase. But yes, that is definitely, that is ultimately how plants will be able to persist in new areas is by successfully reproducing and and creating offspring in those areas. Yeah, good question, Christy. Um, well, I think that's a good transition into what I guess is my last curiosity. And that is when you talk about, yeah, making these larger changes to the ecosystem, say there had been big germination and you had been able to follow for decades. Um, this is sort of, I, I'm sure each ecologist has a different answer, but what are your thoughts on how we should think about building ecosystems into the future? Like should should we consider making those drastic changes to ecosystems and seeding things broadly in order to, you know, to make sure that the species persist or um, should we be a little more hands-off than that? You know, I, I actually don't have a black or white opinion on this. My opinion is, is based on if we make a drastic change, which people do, people have made drastic changes on the different kinds of pine trees that they plant in different plantations to make them more resistant to drought and heat. We are seeing a lot of assisted migration with wildlife to 
putting different individuals with a different genetic, um, like genetic variation into different areas. But we have to do that being very sure of what we're doing because once we've introduced a species into a new area, there's really no going back and, or there often is no going back if it then explodes in that area. So we could do that, but we would have to just be very sure that that is, doesn't have negative effects. And we can do that with long-term studies. We can do that with, with long-term monitoring. Do I think we should generally just sow seeds up along mountain slopes? No, I think we can be mindful of our management. I think when we're hiking, we can stay on the trail and not be trampling all the plants around it. I mean, they're just trying to survive and just minimizing our impact, I think is the best that we can do as an individual person. What I really think needs to happen is we just need to be reducing less emissions and that would solve a lot of our problems. But in the absence of that, I think, I think it's not, I don't think there's a black and white answer because I think if, we, if we're seeding some species higher in elevation than others, we're ultimately going to be favoring ones over another. And it's very hard to know ahead of time which ones it would be because in new areas, the relationship between species might be different than in their, in their native or home ranges. Thank you. That's a that's a good answer. And it's good to know that we just need to solve climate change and, <laughs> and the plants will be okay. Yeah, just, you know, small, small, just a small to do list. Um, well, thanks everyone for for joining today. And uh, yeah, thanks, Natalie, for being a part of part of the co Conservancy community. And uh, yeah, look forward to maybe working with you again in the future. Well, thank you, everyone. These kinds of talks are really the highlight of my work, and it means a lot to me to be able to connect with the people that are local. And then I'm just, you know, not always just staring at plants, but can also meet some of the people. Feel free to drop me a line if you want to stay in touch. I really love hearing from people. And thanks for tuning in.